Hi, High Rock. Wherever you are and whenever you're watching this, whether you're on your own or with others, welcome. Our hope is that this would be a time to connect with God, connect with God's people, and connect with God's purposes. If you're watching this on July 4, then happy Independence Day. One thing I love about the 4th of July weekend celebrations is the fireworks. There's something about that beauty, majesty, and mystery of a fireworks show that, that always leaves me in awe. My hope and prayer today is that as we enter into worship of the living God Almighty and experience God's love and presence and healing and restoration and sense of mission through all the world, we would realize that we are being drawn and invited into that beauty, majesty, and mystery of the living God who loves us and makes all things new. So may we gaze upon our Lord God in awe. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Can everybody sing?
We sing our Father. It all 
to you, God, and I'm trusting you. I, 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 I will trust in. I'm gonna trust in you, Jesus. I'm gonna trust in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let your kingdom. We don't know what we can do, and now we're gonna trust in you. Let your will be done. We're gonna give it all to you. In February of 2020, a group of about 60 High Rockers, including almost the entire staff and board of counselors, embarked on a nine-week journey of U.S. Black history. We followed the well-established pathway of the Nehemiah Project, a Black-led organization founded by Alex G., a fellow pastor in our denomination. He and his team created the course, hoping to help engage the hearts and minds of people who were asking what they could do about racism by helping explain how we got here in the first place. We've asked five participants of this venture to share their experiences in this work and what God did in that process. Taking this course has allowed me to dig deeper into my own racial identity. I was expecting to learn new things, but also confirm some of the things that I've already learned. And boy, was I wrong. I think coming into the course, I had a certain level of understanding about who I am. So I'm a Korean American immigrant and my parents made some radical decisions where I've been in school systems where I was the only non-black student in my class. I've been in situations where I'm the only non-white person. But I realized there's something to be said of not everyone of your same ethnic background goes through the same experiences and allowing others to vent and share and, and seeing the experience of them feeling heard. I think that was really, really pivotal in my own understanding. I realized I might have been a certain way. So for example, I might have been not racist, but throughout the course I've learned I need to level up and become anti-racist. God has really wrestled my heart taking this course. I wholeheartedly recommend taking something like this or some other aspect to engage and to understand and, and to allow collaboration of diverse backgrounds. I think God just really helped me to see that passivity in itself is harmful to our society. I think it's time that we can't just stay quiet I think it's time for all of us to unify together. Let's pray now, asking God to illuminate the truth we encounter in the scriptures. Heavenly Father, the words you speak are true. They are good and they are everlasting. Through your word today, Help us find understanding in the midst of confusion, truth in the midst of deception, and light in the midst of darkness. In the name of Jesus Christ, the living word, amen. Today's reading from the word of God comes from the book of Mark, chapter one, verses one through 15. Pull it up on your Bible app, open up your Bible, or follow along on the screen as I read. That's Mark one, one through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. 
Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, High Rock and friends of High Rock and anyone out there who's just curious about some of the big things of life. I am so glad that you're here right now. My name is Stephen Sharkey. I'm one of the pastors at High Rock, and we're in the middle of a sermon series called Seven Things About God That Might Surprise You. And today we're going to confront one of the things that many of us wrestle with when we consider the idea of a personal, loving, creator God. How could God create a world with so much beauty and so much brokenness? Now consider the world that we live in. This earth is a remarkable place, and there are moments where I think many of us may feel like this is heaven itself. Two years ago, I stepped onto a trailhead in Yosemite National Park at about five in the morning. and There wasn't another soul around at the time. And by early morning, I had crested the rim of the valley and looked down at the majesty of that glacial valley in all its splendor. Waterfalls gushing with spring snowmelt, lush green lining the floor of the valley, blue sky, warm sun. Friends, I have to tell you that it felt like I was in heaven right here on earth. But our, our world isn't always like that, is it? Eight years ago, I took another step, and this time into a brothel in Pune, India. I was led by one of the members of our church partner over there, the Hindustani Covenant Church. And the small door on the side of the street looked like a dark doorway into the pit of hell itself. Once through the door, we climbed a steep stairway, continuing into the darkness through a hole in the ceiling and still going deeper into the space until when we were on the second floor of the building, I saw a long corridor with doors leading to rooms that were no bigger than a very small storage unit. Our leader was bringing us to show one particular room that she knew would be vacant when we could get a sense of just the ghastly conditions into which these young girls had been taken and enslaved. As we were making our way back out towards the street, one of the doors opened, almost right as we were walking past it, and a man came out, clearly surprised and probably embarrassed. He was followed by a young girl with whom I made eye contact for just a moment before she continued down the stairs and back out to the crowded street. Friends, there are moments that we have in our lives that feel too awful to imagine. For me, this was one of them. I didn't feel like I was on earth. I felt like I was in hell. And I asked myself the question that many of us have asked ourselves at certain moments in our lives. How could God create a world like this? Many of us have wondered this. Many of us have been angry with God about the backward nature of this world. A world that in one moment can seem impossibly beautiful and in another moment can seem impossibly hideous. The reality is so stark that many of us have refused to believe in a creator God for the very reason that we don't want to believe in a God who could create this mess that we find ourselves in. God, did you really make this jacked up world and everything in it? Really? Everything? 
So today I want to push back on the idea that God created everything. And that might come as a surprise to some of you who have operated under the assumption that if there is a God, then God did create everything. But there are a couple of exceptions to that idea. Of course, the fundamental theological ideas about God is that God did not create God. God just always was. It's right there in God's name, Yahweh. It means, I am who I am, or literally, the self-existing one. And if you're wondering who created God, well, then God really isn't God at all. And that other creator actually is God. But there's something else that God didn't create that some of us might find both reassuring and possibly perplexing at the same time. God did not create evil, nor did God create hell. Okay, pastor, that is reassuring, but if that's true, then who did create evil and hell? How do we account for those things in the world that we live in? Well, that's exactly what I want to help unpack for you today. And in doing so, what I also hope to uncover for many of us is a better story about who God is and what God's purposes are in this world. But before we continue, I want for us to pause for a moment and think about this world that we live in. Where have you seen glimpses of heaven here on this earth? Where have you seen glimpses of hell? Let's take a minute to think about that and share with one another as you feel comfortable. Welcome back. So let's consider God's creation and God's plan for creation. One of the challenges that we have as we consider our Creator God is that most of us, even Christians, have suffered from an understanding of God's story that is not so much biblical as it is folk religion. And this is all around us. It's even in pop culture. Over the course of the pandemic, like many of you, I found a TV show or two or three or more to binge watch over those months where so many of us were just stuck. One of the things that I binged was a TV show called The Good Place. Now, the basic non-spoiler gist of the show is that a group of deceased people find themselves in the afterlife in what they call The Good Place, or what many of us would call heaven. And as far as they know, they are there in the good place because they have lived such good lives that they were rewarded the opportunity to live out eternity in the good place, paradise, rather than, well, the bad place or hell. Now, the show is really about moral philosophy, not theology. And it is brilliant in the way it continuously weaves various schools of philosophy together. Theologically, however, it's on very shaky ground. Fundamentally, part of the good news of Jesus is that our eternal status is based not on weighing the scales of good and bad from a person's life, but on the perfect record of Jesus. So it's not your record that saves you, it's Jesus' record that saves you. Jesus lived the life you should have lived and he died the death you should have died. Okay, so if the afterlife isn't about performance, what is it about? Does that mean that 
at the end of your life, those of you who know and love Jesus go to heaven, while those who don't know Jesus go to, well, hell, the bad place. That's the way we imagine the trajectory of existence, isn't it? And if that's not what you believe, it's probably what your non-Christian friends think you believe. The generally accepted understanding of our faith is that our lives here on earth are on a trajectory towards a moment when either we die or God closes the curtain on history, at which point we leave earth and go to the new place, some new place that's not earth. It's something else, either heaven or hell. Heaven is a place where maybe there's clouds and angels with harps and we get to bask in the glory of Jesus for eternity and hell is another place where maybe it's dark and hot and we experience eternal torment. This is what most people think you believe. And some of you are here thinking to yourself, uh, Pastor, yeah, I thought that's what I believed. But what if I told you that the problem with that story is that it's all wrong and that the trajectory of your life, the trajectory of the, the cosmos and human history is not either heaven or hell, but something entirely different and something that I would submit to you is actually much better. It's a better story. And fortunately, I don't have to make up a better story. It's actually the story of the Bible. At the very beginning of Scripture, in fact, at the very first verse of the Bible, we have this beautiful summary statement about creation. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say God created earth and the place you go after earth, heaven or hell. In fact, it says nothing about God creating a place called hell. We have two distinct but overlapping realities that God has made, heaven and earth. So in order to help everyone visually capture these two distinct but overlapping realities, I want to share this video that illustrates very well uh, what these overlapping realities look like and how they might operate. These, this video was made by The Bible Project, and it helps succinctly unpack God's creation of heaven and earth. Let's take a look. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other 
was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So, God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So, how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So, we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. Literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so, what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So, in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. Welcome back. And I know that was a fire hose of information, but a couple of things that I hope you can take away from that. First, Heaven is not a destination for deserving souls, as we so often think of it. No, heaven is a reality that is coming here. Earlier, we heard Tom recite the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught to us, where Jesus said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This kingdom of heaven that Jesus was referring to is the perfectly created reality of God that is coming to earth. Not you or me going to heaven, but heaven coming to earth. We see this story throughout the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the text that Tom read for us today from Mark, we see Jesus being baptized, and there is a beautiful moment of foreshadowing that happens here. 
It says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. What a, a beautifully graphic image that we have here in Mark. Heaven was torn open and God's spirit came down on Jesus. There's a brief moment of heaven coming to earth. And Jesus goes on in the very next verse to announce that very reality. Verse 14, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. Oh, okay, pastor, what's the good news? Is, is that like that we get to go to heaven and live forever? Well, no, that's not the good news. But Jesus tells us the good news in the very next verse. And here it is. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Now, the gospel according to Matthew says something very similar, but instead of saying the kingdom of God has come near, what does Jesus say in Matthew? The kingdom of heaven has come near. It's the same thing. Again, it's this beautiful image, not of us going to heaven, but of heaven coming to us. And that is really good news. Because clearly, everything isn't perfect here. There is another reality already here on earth that we have to grapple with, and it's hell. But interestingly, hell was not something created by God. Evil and hell, that was not created by God. Rather, hell is the existence that we humans created when we disobeyed God. And not just humans, but spiritual principalities that, like humans, have disobeyed God and that that disobedience has created the broken hell that we so often encounter here on earth. That's why those words in the Lord's Prayer are so powerful. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Imagine that. When God's will is done everywhere, all the time, that's called heaven. Earth, however, has been a place where God's will is done some of the time, and disobedience, our will, is done most of the time. God didn't create hell. We create our own hell. And God is working through Jesus and with the church to bring about a place where only God's will is done all the time. Another way to put it is this. God is on a mission to get the hell out of earth. Now, a quick story that might help cement that idea in your head maybe a little bit better. My grandparents have one of the sweetest love stories that you'll ever hear. Uh, my, my granddad, Thomas Sharkey, had recently returned home to Brooklyn after serving in World War II. My granny, Peggy Mitchell, was single and working at New York Bell, the phone company in Manhattan. Uh, they both, in a last-minute decision, chose to attend the St. Bridget's Catholic Dance. This was how Catholics met each other back in the 1940s. Well, they met at the dance, and after that, the two were inseparable. My granny kept a diary of every conversation that they had over those first many months. Until one day, Granddad asked my great-grandfather, Larry Mitchell, for permission to marry his daughter. So. Here's the quirky thing Granddad had to say to his future father-in-law about the prospect of marrying his beloved Peggy Mitchell. He said, I love your daughter so much, I want to get the hell out of her name. Okay. Granddad was a funny guy, and he did just that. He got the hell out of her name. He married Peggy Mitchell, in case you didn't pick up on that. And for the past 70-plus years, She's been Peggy Sharkey. I know it's a goofy example from my goofy granddad, and that's what God is out to do with planet Earth. God is on a mission to get the hell out of Earth. Hell and evil stem from the disease of sinful disobedience that we perpetuate every time we choose our own way and not God's way. Our own will, not God's will. 
James puts it this way when he's talking about what we do with the words that we say. Words that can be either edifying and beautiful or destructive and evil. Listen to this. The tongue is a fire, James says. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, isn't that an interesting thing to say? It is itself set on fire by hell. So, hell is not a destination for bad people. Hell is not the bad place. Hell is a reality that we create with our own words, our actions, our thoughts even. I think of the hell that I saw in that brothel in India. Just one of the countless brothels in that city alone. Most of us would look at that and agree, that is awful. That is sick. It's wrong. It's despicable. And we would very rightly hate the hell that that place is and others like it. Well, God hates hell too. But God hates it at a whole other level than we do. God doesn't just hate the brothel and the sex trafficking and all the things that go with it. God hates lust and he confronts the sin right at its source. Hell isn't in the brothel before hell is in the darkness of our own hearts. God didn't create that. But God is determined to rid it from the face of the earth. It gives a whole new perspective on the passage that we heard in the video where John the Baptist says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the story of the Bible is not the story of you and me doing our best to get to the good place. The story of the Bible is the story of God coming to earth from heaven to rid hell from the face of the earth, to end injustice. Jesus said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And you see right there, Jesus gives us the opportunity to participate in what he is doing. He gives us a role. Repent and believe, he says. My part in the story, your part in the story, is believe what Jesus is saying and follow him in obedience. And that tends to be where people kind of check out. That's where Jesus loses people. That's where pastors often lose people. That's where hearts sink because we don't want to obey, do we? We don't want to change our ways and so too often we continue to perpetuate hell on earth. But we have the opportunity to join with God in getting the hell out of earth. Will you participate with God? If you're listening this morning and you feel that tug of war going on in your soul, the tug of wanting to see heaven come to earth against the tug of, I want to do what I want to do, I want to encourage you as I close to just pray these words with me this morning. Lamb of God, take away the sin in me. Lamb of God, take away the sin in me. That's what Jesus came to do to remove it from the whole world. Don't think he can't do it in you. He can. Lamb of God, take away the sin in me. The lust, the greed, the pride, the shame, the vanity, the envy, the self-righteousness. Lamb of God, take away the sin in me. Lamb of God, take away the sin in me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have set yourself on a mission to reclaim the beautiful creation that you made. Come. Come with your power. Use us, your people, to rid this world of the hell that we find here in this place. Use your power in us, God, to bring about justice where there's injustice, to bring your favor where there's brokenness, to bring healing where there's pain. 
where there's sickness. Come, Lord Jesus, and rid this earth, earth, rid this creation of the hell that we find here. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. It's so easy to hide underneath the layers of pretense that we have used to fool others, and we can subtly fool ourselves as well. Jesus came that we may have life, and life to the full, so we can empty ourselves of all falsehood and pretense. And as we pray, Lamb of God, take away the sin in me, we open a door to a right relationship, not only with God, but correspondingly, with ourselves and with each other as well, which brings us peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He came that we may have life and life to the full. On the night he was betrayed, when he was together in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is a sign of the new covenant and represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Some of you might love theology and might be nerding out about this sermon series because you get to wrestle and ponder anew things like the character of God, the nature of heaven, and of hell. Maybe you're even part of the theology lab group and you're just itching to start new conversations on this topic. And some of you might be thinking, hey, uh, Hi Rock, you're starting to kind of shake up what I always thought were kind of givens in my beliefs. I hear you. It can feel unsettling. And if that's you, I invite you to reach out to one of our pastors. We'd love to talk more. But the reason why we talk about theology is because what we believe about God and what he thinks about us in this world, it matters. Last week, as Pastor Walt preached about the love of God pursuing us, I asked my congregation, what might change if you saw yourself in the same way that God saw you? In the same way this week, what might change if you saw heaven and earth the way God sees it? Wouldn't you want to be part of seeing those places where heaven and earth already come together in justice and love and beauty grow and, and flourish and multiply? And so I pray for our eyes to see the difference between the freedoms that God has given us and the freedoms that were bought at the cost of human injustice. Over the course of the summer, all of our congregations, including this online community, are going to be in some kind of relaunching process. And so I invite you to hold on to that question together as a community. What might change in us? Or how might our gathering be shaped if we saw heaven and earth and hell the way God sees it? Not in some far off post-death future, but in the places and spaces where we live and work and study and play right now. How can our community be a glimpse of God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? We continue our worship even when the online service is over in how we give our lives to Christ and seek God's kingdom. So church, as you are sent out, hear this benediction from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly 
than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every day and every day let 
Let your kingdom. We done done all we can do, and now we're gonna trust in you. Let your will. 